haven't updated, if you've changed your email, which Jackie, you had, and we, we lost you, but God put you on my house to contact you. Please see Kathy to update, make sure that your email is on the list because we're basically starting smaller and we need to re regrow. But in that process when it was all rebuilt, the way of finding documents was like mishmash. It was like you had to know how you saved it. And I didn't know how I saved the title. I didn't know the titles of my messages. So it took me a long time before I found them. I found them like a week ago. <laughs> so therefore, it was a complete rebuilding after the 20th on what the Lord would have me share. Matthew 13 was not on the original list. And as I was praying and just saying, Lord, where do we go? What are you saying? It was there that Matthew 13 came to mind. It is a chapter on kingdom parables. Every king has a kingdom. We said this morning that Matthew's theme was presenting Jesus as king. There's more about the kingdom in Matthew and the words of Jesus than any of the other Gospels. You have three major discourses throughout the book of Matthew. You have the Sermon on the Mount, those three chapters. You have the kingdom parables here. And then you have the Olivet Discourse. It's what the king is saying. We want to know what the king is saying about his kingdom. I want to show you not only we're going to be teaching through, but I want to show you how you can detect something very special that God is communicating in his word. If you've heard me teach at all, you know that I'm for the big picture, right? We're looking at the big picture and we're looking at the tiniest details. The big picture with the tiniest details. So keep your chapter open. And we're going to first look at the first three verses. Set your mind, what in this introduction is saying to you, we need to look carefully at what follows. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat before the sea, and great crowds gathered about him so that he got into the boat he got into the boat and sat down and the whole crowd stood on the beach and he told them many things in parables saying a sower went out to sow those three verses 
will alert us that God is directing us to look at the big picture. What in those verses tell us that we have to look at the big picture? He spoke many things in parables. parables. Plural. A little detail, but a very powerful clue. We cannot stop at the first parable. Because if we want to hear the many things, we need to have the big picture of all of the parables that are being referenced here in that introductory remark. When we ended this morning's session, I said we can't stop at verse 14 because it was not the full pericope. Now that was a fancy word. It's okay for you to learn new words, right? Yeah. <laughs> a pericope is just the full text. Anytime that you're looking at scripture, whether you're teaching or even reading for your spiritual well-being, you want to get the full picture and meditate upon that as a whole. We will know when we come to the conclusion of this because there'll be a deliberate conclusion. We will not go there now. We will know it when we get there at the conclusion. But we're not at the conclusion. We are at the beginning. We are at the setting. So we have Jesus in a boat in water. And the second clue, the second clue that there is something very special in this portion of scripture is that he began by saying a sower went out to sow. You say that is a clue? Yes! Because it was Jesus' practice to usually, most commonly in his practice, to teach an object lesson that was near at hand. Look at the lilies, how they grew. Solomon and all his glory. I was like, no, look at He's in a boat, and he's talking about a sower, and a sower going out to sow. Now we read the whole scripture. We're not going to be going through all these scriptures. But let's bring up the next slide, because we are going to observe that there is the introduction parable that is the parable of the sower. How many of you have heard at least one message on the sower? Wave at me. How many of you have heard maybe five messages? Put up five fingers. All right. How many of you have heard a lot of messages? You can do this now. Oh, I, can't. I have some people going like this. So we have no need of looking at that particular portion. But I suggest to you that the sower is the introduction, and we will give you evidence of that as we proceed. But then as we read through those 
the entire chapter, you will make an observation that there follows six parables. And these parables are paired so that there are two parables with different topics, but with the same teaching. But uniquely, you're going to see that the parable of the wheat and tares, which is number two, is paired with parable number seven, the dragnet. That should be a hint. That should be a very large exclamation point to you because in between those two parables, we have two pairs, but they're like this. See, you see number three, number four, mustard seed in leaven, they're together. And you can see very clearly they join together. But then you go on and five and six, treasure in a field and the pearl of great price, how are they? They're together. But they are embraced by two. What are we seeing? Would you go to the next slide? Let me give you this diagram. This diagram shows us, and I, I'm sorry, it's better on your notes than it was, because when I tried to put this on the slide, I couldn't get the house holder on the other side of that. So the house holder on the linear line is better on your, your printout that you have. It, it's behind. So what we have is parentheses, introduction, so are parentheses, tears, and wheat. At the end of the parentheses, we have the dragnet. In between, we have two other pairs of parables. And then we have the householder at the end. Now, I said we wouldn't go to the conclusion yet, but may I, my, may I turn to it so you can tell that we know where we're going is the right, what we're supposed to be including. Is that okay? So, turn over. And we want to look at the verse 51. This is after the other parables. And it says, have you understood all these things? What things? Remember the introduction? That he was going to teach what? Many things. So do you see the connection between the introduction and the conclusion, if you're being taught many things here, we want to know that we got the many things, right? So we have to get the full pericope. We have to get the big story. So we find, finally, we get to, to those verses, and it says, do you understand? Do you understand all of these things? Now, by the time we're through this afternoon, I'm going to ask you that question. And if you say, no, I don't understand it, we're going to say some more. <laughs> because I want you to get this truth. So that shows us that what's between is extremely important. We are going to be introduced to truths. We're not going to reiterate the parables because you know them well. And I thank you, Debbie, for your prayer that the word is going to fall on good soil. Is your soil all plowed up and ready? I, I was convinced last year to plant a garden that was my father's whole plot, um, his first garden. And when I went back home after I retired, my niece came over to my house and she said, I took her, do you want me to plow up the garden? Do you want me to plow up Grampy's garden? And I said, no way. <laughs> I had all the work with that, no way. But last year, I just happened to take some seeds from a, a butternut squash in the spring of the year. And I said, well, look at all those seeds. It's Nice 
some long thing. Let me just dig a hole in my flower bed and throw them in. Well, they germinated. <laughs> and I mean, I had tons of plants with no place to plant them. So I went over to my niece and I said, I know you've already put the tractor away. I didn't finish the sentence. Yeah. She was running to the tractor. She jumped on the tractor. She had it for, for the, uh, the, she plowed it up and she says, now I'm Ginger, I'll be back in a week and a half. But I want you to put all the leaves and, and the grass seeds and, and the lawn, you, you, you just get that soil ready. Well, if we have to do that for a natural garden, yeah. What do we have to do for our, our spiritual soil? I mean, if my niece is telling me, Ginger, my Ginger, you gotta get that soil ready. Put the leaves in. Put the fertilizer. She said that you get a bed in line. If we give that much attention to the natural, how much more should we pay attention to the spiritual so that our soil is going to be good soil, fertile soil, so that it can bring forth 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold. Now, here's some other interesting observations. <laughs> the parable of the sower is not introduced by the words, the kingdom of heaven is like. When you get to the parable of the tares and the wheat, it's introduced by the kingdom of heaven is like. The six following parables are introduced by the words, the kingdom of heaven is like. Yet we would not know that it was on the kingdom unless the disciples came to ask. And they did. Now, Jesus ended his teaching on the sower with he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then his disciples come to him and said, why are you, why do you talk to the people in parables? Why are you always speaking in parables? And Jesus explains it's for you to know. I, I said last night that I was going to explain to you how I feel, why I feel, that deep truths in God's word are shrouded in mystery. I believe that God doesn't say things clearly in God's word for the deep, deep, deep things because he wants us, his disciples, to have ears to hear. Have you ever talked to someone and you know your words were going like, <laughs> Did you ever have that feeling? They're not listening. <laughs> He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And there is truth here in this chapter that many have never seen because they did not get the clues. And some of the greatest teachings that the Lord has shown to me have been covered with mystery. So I I teach my students, and I, I do still teach through Zoom, 
I really am so happy. Thank you for coming. I thank you so much. I love seeing real faces. Real faces. Instead of these little blocks. <laughs> faces and then sometimes their name comes up. And you know they left the room. <laughs> and it distracts me. Because all of a sudden my mind is going, where did they go? I was supposed to be teaching, right? I'm supposed to be teaching, but my mind is split on what I'm teaching. And where did that student go? <laughs> so thank you for being here. And thank you that you're one of those disciples that you're so hungry to hear that you're going to get the truth. God is expanding it. But when I'm teaching, besides telling my students to look at the big picture and the little details, I also instruct them to be careful to hear what is not being said. To be careful to hear what is not being said. Parable of the sower was not introduced as a parable of the kingdom in the beginning, right? No mention of the kingdom of heaven is like a sower. How do we know? Where do we get that? In the explanation. In the explanation, when the disciples come, he says to you, in verse 11, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Do you call yourself a disciple of Christ? Are you one of those ones that says, I want to know, I want to have ears to hear? Because he's ready to speak to you. He's ready to reveal the secrets, the secrets of the kingdom. Go beyond the surface. Don't just hear the frilly stuff. But you go deep. Connect, as my Aunt Dot would say, connect the dots. Connect the dots. Get the whole picture to get to know the secrets. So we're going to explore, and I'm going to show you that if we look carefully, God is pointing us in the right direction. The parable of the tears is the next one. It follows the parable of the sower. The parable of the tares we have a field, we have the wheat growing, the seed that was planted in the first parable, the seed that was planted in the first parable was the, what is it? I'm, when I go like this, I want an answer. The word. Does that connect with anything we've had today? Yes. <laughs> All right. So the seed was the word. We go on deeper and say, it's not just the word, it's Jesus. Jesus has been planted in the good soil. Jesus has been planted in the good soil. Has Jesus been planted in your good soil? So in the parable of the tares, we are seeing a connection to the first introductory parable. The word was the seed. It was planted in good soil, or bad soil, or thorny soil, or rocky soil, blah, blah, blah. But 
but we're looking at the good soil because we're here. <laughs> and we're good soil. We're here because we want to know. So our hearts are the good soil that's going to produce 30%, 16%, 100 Now I realize when I'm speaking that not everyone's going to get 100%. Oh, I wish you all would get 100%. I know that in my students' class, when I give a test, no, very few, no, none of them have gotten 100%. <laughs> There's varying degrees. This 30%. Well, if you get 30%, yay! If you get 60%, yay! If you get 100%, But in the parable of the tares, the seed has taken root. And what we see is the wheat, being the believers, they're growing. Is Jesus causing you to grow? You're the wheat. But in that account, we have an enemy that comes out, that throws in, Seed that is weeds, tares, oh, and it begins to grow. That's a real picture of the life that we're living in and the world that we're in. Because we're growing with Christ growing in us. But there's a lot of weeds around us, and the weeds have been identified because there's only two parables here. Only two parables of the seven that the disciples asked about. The parable of the sower and the parable of the tares. And they didn't ask that until they had the other, other between of the mustard seed and the leaven. So we, we see some motion here. But when they got Jesus alone, back in the house, they said, what about the tears? So we see that those two are connected again. They are connected again for us to get more understanding. So the word, Jesus, the word is put into our soil. We're growing, so in the parable of the tears, we are the wheat, and we are growing, but the enemy is throwing in his seed all around us. So the word was, the laborers went to the master and said, should we go and pull out all of the weeds? And the answer was, no, if you pull out all the weeds, you're going to pull out the good wheat along with it. Let them grow. Let it grow until the harvest. And at the harvest, then let them, the angels, come. Oh, we, we, oh yeah, I haven't been telling you to keep moving these things. Okay, no, no, wait, 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 let's go back. All right, all right, that's okay. We'll skip that one. Go ahead. So when we compare this, we see that the enemy has planted the wheat around, but what is being said, um, in fact, go on to the next one. All right, comparing this with the next. Do you see why we are saying that these two parables go together? Because both of them are going to the end time, so the truth that we have with the parable of the tares and the wheat and the parable of the net, the dragnet, is that it is looking to, it's both present, the growing, it it's both, has the elements, the kingdom of God is both present with us, but it also has a future. So we, the kingdom is both present and future. And both of these parables in the last days, the emphasis being in the harvest, or in the last times when it's pulled in, that the angels, angels are both 
The reapers are the ones that are doing the separation of the fish, the good and bad. So we have a separation of the wheat and taters, and we have a separation of the good fish and the bad fish. That is a picture of end times when there will be the harvest and the reaping, and there will be a separation of the children of God and the children of the devil. There is going to be a separation. Now, it makes it very clear in those parables, does it not, that the children of God with Jesus growing within them are going to be brought to heaven. The others, it says that you take the tares and you throw it into the furnace. Well, we don't like to speak of that word, do we? But it's, it's biblical and it's real. There is a time of separation of heaven. Oh, and that word that we do not want our lips to utter. <coughs> but it's real. Hell, fire, it's real. And that day is real. So we have in the kingdom a separation. Now, think of this. What has happened? It is made up of the redeemed who have had Christ growing within. And their joy is being in the Lord. That's what heaven's all about. That's the joy of being united with the lover of our souls in eternity. So there is that picture of both present and future in these two parentheses parallels. These two parentheses parables, these two embracing stories. So let's make an observation here. Let's go on to the next slide. The first set within the parentheses, very short, very brief, very elementary, we have the account of a mustard seed. And we have that of the lemon. This is speaking that the kingdom of God is growing. It is both growing internally and growing externally. So we have the picture of the mustard seed. It's the tiniest of seeds. It is planted in and it becomes a big bush. A big, and it tells us that the animals can find refuge, the birds, everything. So it grows and we can see an external growth. The kingdom of God is growing externally. We can see it. It's obvious. Our eyes can behold it. But it's also an internal growth, like the leaven that leavens bread. We do not see what's happening, but we see it expanding internally. If some of you make bread and you know, I remember one day my, my mother used to make, make bread. And this picture came to my mind. I wasn't planning on sharing it. But one time, it, she, it was late in the afternoon, and uh, she never did get it in the oven. So she put the, the loaves that were rising on the radiator. Oh, <laughs> Some of you already anticipated what happened in the morning. She woke up in the morning, and the dough had raised up and it was going right down the radio. She said she just scooped it up 
unite with this first one, but this one is an intentional seeker. An intentional seeker who is looking for that perfect pearl. And he finally finds that pearl above all pearls. He sells everything else and he comes back and he purchases that pearl. What we're seeing here are two individuals. And you know it. You can identify, and I am sure that you can identify, maybe you can classify yourself, that there are individuals who really aren't searching for God. But all of a sudden, whoops, <laughs> they bump into the Lord, and immediately, immediately, they recognize the worth of the treasure. The worth of the treasure of Jesus. And they sell everything. And their life is completely changed. They weren't looking in that direction. But there are other people. And my grandfather, Whippy, was this kind of a man. He, he was a searcher. He just knew that there was more than what he had experienced. He knew there was more, and, and he was just searching here, and searching there, and searching there, and searching there. And then he found the treasure, the pearl, a great price. So we see all the different elements of the kingdom. And it reminds me of, of a story of four blind men that went to a zoo and they were introduced to a, an elephant. And each one was feeling <coughs> the elephant. And when they were leaving the scene, oh, Because he had the trunk. Huh? Oh no, said the others. That's not right. And the other one said, no, he's like a big wall. Because he had the side of it. <coughs> Each one had gotten a part. Each one was right, but yet each one was incomplete. And even in this account, we have, in the parables, parts of the kingdom. But guess what, my friends? It's just part. There's so much more. And we have more parables in Matthew of the kingdom. And I suggest we really just scratching the surface. But what have we learned? What have we learned about the kingdom from Matthew 13? We've learned that it's both present and future. We've learned that it's growing growing internally and growing externally. We've learned that it's precious, precious, costly, dear, worthy of selling everything that we have to obtain <coughs> the treasure. That's what we've seen. Come to the very end. We, we, we did jump ahead. And in verse 51, again, we're asked this question Have you understood all these things? And I ask 
ask you, have you understood all of these things? I'm looking. Is this a trick question? <laughs> <laughs> you have questions. <laughs> okay, what we're going to do then is I'll open it up for questions, but let me just conclude this for the video, okay? And for you online, hello. But let's we'll finish this this conclusion here because look at this. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. Their answer was yes. And then it says, Jesus answered them and said these words, therefore, every scribe who has been given, has been trained for the kingdom of heaven, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house. Now listen to this carefully. Who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. That is something to chew about. Chew on. Because there are old treasures based on the word in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Follow me. And then we'll talk and you can ask questions. There are old treasures, a scribe. <coughs> that position was a Jewish position. They will learn it in the Old Testament scriptures. But a householder is like a scribe that he brings out of his household treasures that's old. Uh -huh. His treasures in that Old Testament and treasures that are new. And my friend, as students of God's word, We will get the complete pictures yeah. when we see the treasures of the Old Testament mm -hmm. joined together with the treasures of the New. Remember that saying that I quoted? The Old Testament is explained. The New Testament is contained in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is explained in the New Testament. And when, when we can join them together and connect them, we're having treasures in our household. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. I'm so glad you're here. My household, <laughs> well, my household, get these treasures. And all of you want your household to get the treasures. So absorb. Don't neglect the Old Testament, my friends. Some people don't like to read the Old Testament. Okay, genealogies I know. I challenge him. I give you permission to listen to him. That's what I do. But I, I listen. Because then I know how to pronounce all those names too. <laughs> but when it comes to a portion where I know there's going to be list chronicles. I'm just beginning chronicles in my private devotions. I am going to listen to the first few chapters, I guarantee it. But there's treasures in the old. Mm -hmm. But they will be magnified when they're united with treasures in the new.
Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for the treasures hidden within your word. Father, just make these truths real to our hearts. Let us continue to chew on them. Mm -hmm. And even be in our session of questions and answers now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.